Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's sustainability practice group call. I want to hand it over to Marco Richard um, to do the formal introduction of today's speaker and get going with today's session while I get Tisha's screen up on, and um, we can start viewing her PowerPoint. So, Mark and Richard, okay. over to you. Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, welcome to the July session of the sustainability practice group. My name is Richard Moore, co-chair of the CSI group. Today's topic will be cradle to cradle, an approach for evaluating building products for human and environmental health. Presented by Tish Tablin, Senior Manager, Communications and Education, McDonough Ranga Design Chemistry. Today's format would be a 45-minute PowerPoint presentation followed by a short Q&A from the audience. Tish Tablin manages communications, education, and business development for McDonough Ranga Design Chemistry, which advises companies on integrating the cradle-to-cradle principles into products, operations, and corporate strategy to regenerate economy, ecology, and equity. Tish has spent over a decade focused on helping communities and companies understand complex environmental issues and create solutions. Her previous employment includes working at nonprofit organizations focused on environmental health, biodiversity, recycling, environmental justice, and green collar jobs. Tish has a BA in sociology from the University of Virginia, MA in education from La Jolla Marymount University, and is pursuing an MS in environmental science and policy from the John Hopkins University. She maintains a lead green associate credential from Green Building. This session will discuss C2C product screen and C2C certified program to select environmentally preferred products that have been evaluated for material health, material reutilization, renewable energy, carbon management, water stewardship, and social responsibility. Of course, McDonald Brongard has been a leader in green certified products since 2005, and we look forward to this presentation. Tish will now take the mic. Hello. Well, thank you. Thank you all for having me. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'll go ahead and, and get started because I definitely have a lot I want to cover and I want to make sure we have time for questions. So, of course, cradle to cradle is sort of a, a play on words of the term cradle to grave. So our, our typical model for how we make and dispose of products today is, is a cradle to grave model. So, of course, we're taking materials from the cradle of the earth. We're making products. And you know, after a very short yeast cycle, they generally go to the grave of the landfill. So cradle to cradle is, of course, the idea that we can keep all these materials in continuous use cycles. If we model our industry after nature, there is no waste. So of course we can eliminate the concept of waste if we try to model after nature. So in nature, um, everything has a purpose and everything um, has a use. So we can design industry to do the same thing. So cradle-cradle design um, has, when people say cradle-to-cradle, cradle, they use it to mean a few things. It is a practice of how we try to um, design products. It's a design philosophy, so it's a way of thinking about systems that can apply to buildings, that can apply to communities, um, it can apply to infrastructure. So it definitely has applications beyond just products. Um, and it's also a quality standard, so we'll really be focusing the talk on the cradle-to-cradle cradle certified program which is specifically applied to products. So the, the cradle to cradle to family is quite large. Um, the, um, my company owners are Willie McDonough and Michael Brongart. They are the um, co-owners of the company, the co-authors of the book Cradle to Cradle and the Upcycle. And so these are some of the official organizations that do sort of cradle to cradle work. There's McDonough Brongart Design Chemistry. And we founded the Cradle Cradle Certified Program in 2005. And in 2010, uh, the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute was founded um, to take over administration of the certification program. So they actually take on similar roles. It's similar to the GBCI forming, um, spinning off from USGBC. But they sort of play dual roles um, that those organizations do. They, they manage all the licensing, they manage the certification of the products, but they also manage the standard as well. So they are really doing, um, running the whole certification program. And MBDC is now considered one of the four accredited assessors for the program. So basically, you have any product or company that wants to get certified, you work with an assessor. And then we together submit that application to the Institute. 
Um, if you've, um, APEA is another organization. They are one of the four credit assessors. That's Michael Brongard's consulting firm. And then there's William McDonough and Partners, which is the um, design firm of William McDonough. Okay, so um, the cradle to cradle principle. So a lot of people associate cradle to cradle with closing the loop, which definitely is is the main focus. We talked about keeping safe and healthy materials in closed loop cycles, um, but definitely as we've evolved our practice um, of these of cradle to cradle, we've really expanded it to five principal areas, including material health, material utilization, core to cradle to cradle. But we also look at renewable energy, we look at water stewardship, and we look at social fairness. So these are also the five categories that are um, tenants in the cradle to cradle certified program. So we'll be going through um, what are the criteria that, mi that are applied to products aligning with these principles. So one thing I want to point out is the language that we use is very positive. Um, so in our cradle to cradle language, we like to say we're going, we're going beyond being less bad. So typical sustainability often uses eco, what we call eco-efficiency terms. Um, and it's usually kind of pointing to zero. So can we minimize our toxic chemical use? Can we aim for zero waste? Can we reduce our energy and carbon footprint? So it's reduce, reduce, avoid kind of going to zero. And one thing that we really focus on is can we go beyond just being less bad? Is there more to it? Can we actually envision products and systems and buildings that are actually positive um, for people and the planet? So we focus on, can we actually improve the health of people and planet with our designs? Can we make all materials nutrients for new systems instead of focusing on just making less waste? Instead of reducing our carbon footprint to zero, can we use all clean renewable energy and replenish clean water supplies and build community instead of avoiding um, human rights violations? So this is how we this upcycle chart that you should be seeing now, um, this is how we visualize um, inventory and assessment and optimization. So we talk about continuous improvement, that these eco-efficient steps of, let's say, reducing our carbon footprint are very important, but it shouldn't be the end goal. The end goal should be moving as we minimize our negative impacts, we're also optimizing our positive impacts. So as we're reducing our carbon footprint, let's also make sure we're building and adding on our renewable energy. As we're reducing our um, waste and minimizing the waste we're producing, are we also redesigning those products so that they can stay in closed loop cycles and building the infrastructure to make sure we're getting it back and they're going into useful places. So instead of using less chemicals, are we also redesigning um, to only use safe and healthy materials? So the goal is in each of those five categories, let's work towards that completely positive vision. So that is the idea of the Cradle to Cradle Certified Program. It's really operationalizing that chart, operationalizing that vision of um, stepwise taking steps to be more eco-efficient and pushing and guiding companies and products to product design to also be eco-effective. Okay, so I think we, I talked about the history of the program a little bit, that it's now um, administered by the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, and that there are accredited assessors that you work with, so it helps explain what is MBDC's role compared to the Institute's role. So um, that, I think that still is a little bit of a point of confusion if you haven't heard of the Institute. Um, and so here are some of the, the benefits for product manufacturers um, and also for anyone who would like to use Cradle Cradle certified products in their building. Um, of course, they contribute to lead credits, which I'll go over in detail um, on the next slide. Um, they're also listed in the US EPA's Environmentally Preferable Purchasing Program. Um, so that program is or that it's a database actually hosted by the EPA that lists what they consider to be green products. So any of our certified products are eligible to be listed there. And what that really means is that um, since federal agencies are required um, to purchase green and they have certain requirements for how they do the procurement, 
um, they can choose from products in that database. So it helps um, promote some of those products. If you are working for a federal agency or you're building, um, designing a building for a federal agency, you know, that is a good resource you can use and Cradle Cradle certified products are included in there. Another program we're partnering with is Green Wizard, which I know um, did the, the last presentation for this group. Um, so we also have a similar connection that we, we are making sure that our building products that are certified get listed in Green Wizard in a way that you should be able to um, search for Cradle Cradle certified products and be able to find them easily if you're already using the Green Wizard software. And then, of course, we, we also have a connection with um, BIFMA Level. So a lot of our furniture clients um, have their products both certified cradle to cradle and certified to BIFMA Level. And our material health assessments that we do for those products can also work for BIFMA. So a lot of our clients do both because they can basically hit two birds with one stone. So there are a lot of options out there. If there are any manufacturers out there or people um, working with these programs, um, it's good to know that our that the Cradle Cradle Certified Program can um, work with these other partners. So here are three different lead credits that you can get for using Cradle Cradle Certified products in a building. So the first one um, was started in 2007. There's actually a credit interpretation ruling for innovation and design. And so that was applicable for all of the rating systems at the time. So it, you know, it's definitely changed a little bit, um, you know, over in the past six years since more and more um, rating systems have emerged. Um, and of course, innovation and design credits now um, are no longer precedent setting. So technically, um, even with our credit interpretation rule, the you know, GBCI. Um, reserves the right to just approve them on a case-by-case -case basis. So the, the feedback we're getting is that people are still using the template that was written, which is using at least 2.5% by cost, um, Cradle Cradle certified products in your building. And so they are still awarding that credit as far as we know. So that in, um, we are getting that feedback that it's still being used. We're not sure if that's going to change now that there are um, new credits written into LEED version 4. We're not sure yet. I guess we'll have to see um, as people apply for that. Um, yep. yep. This is, uh, sorry, this is Richard here. Uh, that's been my experience as well. Uh, they no longer take uh, grandpa uh, innovation credits uh, as a uh, given. Um, but it has been your experience that they will grant the point uh, on the credit to cradle certified products if they yes, meet the, the cost threshold. Yes. So, at, you know, as of lead 2009, you know, they sort of got rid of their um, credit interpretation like database and right. they basically said it's not present setting, but right. you know, you're getting feedback from architects that they're still getting credit. That's, that's so, good news. Yeah, but you're saying um, you're saying your uh, experience has been once it's kind of written in. So, if you look at the bottom bullet, we are now written in lead version four. So, are you saying? You know, once it's in kind of a credit like this, you don't think they take the ID credit anymore? No, no, I'm, I'm saying that, that it's not a given that they will grant it based on the old right. version 2.2. So right. it's good to hear that they have accepted uh, Cradle to Cradle um, survey products as an innovation. Yes, Just exactly. Because so I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, okay. and then what I haven't gotten feedback on for sure is if having a new credit in lead version 4 will impact that. Right, right, yeah, that uh, remains to be seen. Right. Um, so, our, you know, we also have lead, if you're still working in any older um, rating systems, lead for homes 2008, we're still listed in there as an environmentally preferable material. Um, and then the new credit in lead version 4 um, is applicable for BD&C, IDNC, and EBOM rating systems. And um, it's two up to two points. So the first point is using 20 different products from five different manufacturers. And again, only certain levels apply. So we, I can um, go over that in detail, or you can read which levels apply, because it's different if it's version 2 or version 3 and of our certification. And then option 2 is um, the next level point, which is much more difficult. You have to use products for at least 25% by cost. And it has to be the higher level. So if you, if your product is certified under version two of our program, it's gold level or platinum level. 
And if the product is certified under version three of our program, um, it can be silver, gold, or platinum. So it's the higher levels of our certification and you have to meet the cost requirements. So it's, that second point is a pretty high bar. And again, so this is just um, an outline of the history of our program. So I've really talked about most of these points already. Um, you know, the, the next point I would put on the timeline is that in 2000, we just launched our new um, version 3 for the Cradle Cradle program in 2013. So it really went into effect for products in 2013. And what that means is any of the products I'm really talking about are really grandfathered under version 2 right now. And under the program, those products have until January 1st, 2015 to um, meet the new version 3 standards. So most of the products you see out there now that you'll be um, looking to spec in your products have met version 2 requirements and not version 3. However, I will be talking about version 3 requirements in, in the presentation. So just to kind of make that mental note that the version 3 standard is definitely much harder. Um, so as I'm talking about these criteria, you know, it will take another year or so before most of the products catch up to version 3. Okay, so how is our program different? Um, our program is unique because we are we are biting off a lot compared to other green labels. And so one way we're different um, is we really don't limit um, very much what products and materials we accept. So let's say you know BIFMA is specific to furniture, interior furniture. There's a, a carpet certification. Cradle Cradle certified can really be applied to anything from furniture to polymers to metals to um, interior materials to cleaning products. It really applies across the board. There are very few exceptions such as you know, food or pharmaceuticals or weapons and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so that does help as far as having um, a lead point for us. You get a much wider variety of products to choose from in order to get that 2.5% cost for the ID credit or the 25% cost for the new lead four credit, V4 credit. You have a wide range of products to choose from. And there's also multiple levels of achievement. So you know, so a lot of certifications are binary. They're pretty much pass-fail, like organic, you're either organic or not. Um, and other certifications, you know, Green Guard, you sort of pass or fail. Whereas we have multiple levels. So there is a little bit more of education that we have to do as to what do each of the levels mean. And I think um, LEAD has done a pretty good job of recognizing what are the achievements at each level. And you'll see in, the, in that LEAD V4 credit, um, they weight the achievement accordingly um, by cost and, and by number. Um, and there are also multiple categories of criteria. So again, like Green Guard really just focuses on VOC emissions. Um, but we look at you know, those five categories. We're looking at material health, material utilization, water, renewable energy, social fairness. So we're really looking at the overall sustainability of a product, not just one or two criteria. Um, so here is how the certification level is determined. Because we have multiple levels and multiple criteria categories, um, we basically it's the um, lowest common denominator. Whatever your lowest level of achievement is in any category, that is your certification level. So for example, in this um, product scorecard that you see, out of the five categories, that product met criteria um, at the silver level in three categories gold in one, platinum in one. So the overall certification level is silver. So actually, in the next um, few months, the, the Institute is working on updating their website so that you will actually be able to see the scorecard like this. So let's say if, you have a, if you're designing a hospital and material health and VOC emissions are the most important thing for you, you can look at the scorecard and see, well, this is a silver level product, but it actually met gold or platinum criteria for material health. And that's the most important category for me. So that can be useful information for people specking products. 
or if the um, life cycle of the energy is more important or carbon um, emissions is important, you can go down to the category level and see where they achieve. So again, since their certification level might be lower than what they achieve in any one category. So what I'm going to go over quickly for you. Um, you know, generally, what are the criteria in each category? So we're not going to get too detailed, but what is the intention um, that we're trying to achieve in each category? So in material health, um, you know, again, what the goal is to have completely safe and healthy materials for human and environmental health. So in order to do that, we do a very detailed inventory and assessment proce process for all of the materials and chemicals in a product down to the parts per million level, which is 0.01%. In addition, they, if there are any problematic ingredients, you have to develop a plan to, to fix those issues, to try to optimize, to have the healthiest and safest ingredients you can, um, and make a commitment to phasing out hazardous chemicals. Um, so those plans you know, can be loose. So for example, you know, flame retardants are an issue right now. And for a lot of manufacturers, there aren't um, any safe alternatives yet that meet the, the flammability standards. So you know, that's why we included a plan, because depending on what the, the issue is, there may not be solutions out there yet. There may need to be some innovation before they can do any optimization. So, so that is why we include sort of um, different options for manufacturers to improve their um, formulations. So here is an, um, here's a bill of materials. So this is an example of the level of detail we're asking for from manufacturers. So if we, this is a bill of materials for a task chair, like one from Herman Miller or Steelcase. So for each part, they have to list it by material. We have to know um, the base material. We want to know any colors or finishes that are put on the product, um, and then from that, you know, what's not shown on here is that we also um, contact their supplier. So we contact the supplier of every base material. We contact the supplier of every finish, every paint, every colorant, anything that's put in the product. We contact that, um, that supplier, and we get the formulation of the entire product down to 100 parts per million. So if you look at this chart, um, which you're looking at, so we're basically really breaking it down until we literally have everything down to um, the chemical level by chemical cast number. So something as simple as a, a fabric or a textile may have 20 suppliers if they have um, you know, seven different dyes and colors they're using. We have to contact each um, dye supplier and get the ingredients for every different colorant that goes in those dyes. Um, if there are... Um, finishes for that fabric, we also contact those suppliers and, and work through that supply chain that way. So, and that's definitely the, the longest part of the process for products to get certified because this is the category that we go the deepest out of all five categories. Um, so one, one change in version three is that we've um, increased our band list. So in version two, um, the main chemical that was not allowed is, is PVC or polyvinyl chloride or anything related to it, um, chloroprene, chloroprene, PVDC, et cetera. Um, and under version three, so again, starting in 2013, any new products getting certified cannot have any chemicals on this list. Um, flame retardants, phthalates, chlorinated hydrocarbons, PFOA, so it's definitely a long list. And if you look at, there are two asterisks, asterisks at the bottom. Um, so depending on if the product is intended to be a biological nutrient, meaning if it's going to go back into the biosphere or get composted at the end of life, um, there are additional um, chemicals on the ban list for those since they're going directly back into the biosphere. So here's a sample of how we, oh, I'm having some difficulty here. Okay, um, so here's a sample of how we do an assessment rating for a material. We, it's sort of a stoplight approach, um, red, yellow, and green. 
Green is, of course, the best, A and B. We even have two levels of green. Are you, um, A is the ideal, B, um, green is excellence, yellow is acceptable, um, red is X or highly problematic. Um, gray is we don't have enough information or, um, the, or the supplier would not share the formulation. Um, and of course, black is banned. So each material will get an A, B, C, X or colored rating accordingly. And how we come to a rating for a material is we start at the chemical level. So at the chemical level, each chemical gets an ABCX rating. And then um, we take into account um, exposure scenarios for that chemical. And then it gets rolled into a material assessment. So I, I have a little, more, a little bit more detail on that in the upcoming slides. So. But let me start with the chemical hazards. So for each individual chemical, so let's say if we're looking at um, a pure nylon 6 resin, um, each chemical is evaluated with that ABCX rating in each of these um, toxicity endpoints. So for human health, um, we have priority criteria such as carcinogenicity, endocrine disruption, mutagenicity, developmental toxicity, and then we're also looking at some environmental health endpoints. Um, you know, ranging from bioaccumulation to soil toxicity to climate impacts. So they get rated on all of these criteria. And then, you know, based on usually the lowest denominator, um, if there are Xs for some of these categories, the entire chemical will probably get rated as an X. So here's an example of a material. So this is a nylon 6 resin, and what you're looking at is that nylon 6 resin has you know, six different chemicals listed here. So the first chemical listed is the base resin, so it has a green or an um, A or B profile. And then we consider um, if there are any risks for that chemical, um, what is the exposure risk? So does that mitigate or improve? Um, the chance that a human or the environment will be exposed to that chemical. And so we take that into account, and then we kind of roll that into the overall risk assessment for that chemical. So let's say if you look at the, the bottom chemical, the pigment, the hazard profile is red, meaning there's something in there that um, is potentially harmful to human and environmental health based on those endpoints I just showed you. However, what happens in a pigment is once the pigment is um, is in the base resin or kind of rolled into the fiber, um, it's not really a health risk for you anymore. So, for example, carbon black is a very common um, colorant used in fibers. Carbon black is considered a carcinogen, but it's carcinogenic as an inhalation hazard when you manufacture the product. So once your fiber is already dyed black, there's really no inhalation risk anymore because it's not in powder form. So when we look at it with exposure considered, that risk is mitigated. So that's why it goes from red to yellow when we look at the exposure included. And so that the final chemical risk assessment for the pigment is yellow. So that is that consideration of exposure is one of the things that makes us different from other programs and other toxicology programs that I'll talk about at the end. So there are other um, programs that were um, like HPD and Living Building Challenge and Green Screen, who are doing similar things. Um, but this is one of the factors that makes ours different. So we're, we're trying to give some real life examples um, to allow us to um, use chemicals more, chemicals more wisely. So if you know, carbon black showed up on everyone's red list, we would have nothing black in the world because it would just be on everyone's red list. So when in reality, once it's actually molded into a product, um, that carcinogenicity risk is really, is really gone. Um, so here are some examples. So for each category, I'm going to give some examples of how some of our clients are applying these principles. So con construction specialties really uses our um, methodology as a guiding principle for how they 
um, choose and select ingredients. So in order to get to the gold level, even in version 2, you cannot have any ingredients anywhere in the supply chain down to 100 parts per million or below that are um, considered, that are rated as an X or considered harmful to human and environmental health. So that's a pretty huge achievement when we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of chemicals in a lot of these products. Akoya is another great example. It's an alternative to um, pressure-treated exterior wood. And they just have a very simple design. They use um, basically acetic acid to um, treat the wood for exterior use. And acetic acid is basically just vinegar. Um, so there's nothing harmful in this product. It can be used in gardens. It can be composted at end of life. So it's sort of this idea that we can design simply and just avoid toxic chemicals to begin with. Um, you know, then we eliminate the problem of what happens to it as that product abrades or as, when we're done with that product at the, the end of life. Material utilization is the next category. So again, um, we're looking at is it designed as a biological nutrient? Can it go back to soil safely? Can the product um, be recycled or reused infinitely are the two goals for this category. Um, so we basically have a scoring system um, that rates the percentage of the product that can be recycled or composted, and that's weighted times two. And then we also look at, have they done any work to source responsibly? Are they using any recycled or rapidly renewable content? And so that's, it's basically a weighted percentage score. And so at the different levels, um, you're required to have a certain score. So at the bronze level, it's 35. You know, on up to the platinum level, you need a score of 100. So some examples of, of products, certified products that have achieved this. You know, Shaw um, Industries has, has, uh, has really led the industry um, and helped turn around the whole carpet industry. Now, most carpet companies are doing some kind of carpet take back, which, but Shaw was really the innovator and the first one to do it. Um, they're keeping 300 million pounds of carpet, um, post-consumer carpet, out of landfills each year. They incorporated some really smart design by avoiding some materials such as PVC. Um, and they're also making it a good business. And I think that's one thing that uh, makes Shaw stand out is they're really showing that um, it's a good business model for companies to take back materials and they're saving money in doing so. Um, design text is um, a material that was designed to be compostable from the start. We started with rapidly renewable um, bio-based materials and once they eliminated the toxic materials they were actually able to turn their waste into mulch for gardens and before that they were having an issue of their waste having to be shipped out to Spain from Switzerland um, as hazardous waste. So they eliminated a lot of issues just by going through their supply chain and really trying to identify can we make our same product with only non-toxic dyes. And then of course we look for, company, for products to um, focus on 100% um, renewable energy use. And in the certification program, it does not have to be on-site generation. We recognize renewable energy certificates. We recognize um, sort of purchase agreements with your energy provider. Um, so, and we're also recognizing carbon offsets um, for carbon emissions. Herman Miller is, is our is one product or one company who is using 100% green electrical energy for all of their worldwide offices. So they're doing that through, again, energy purchase agreements. They're doing that by purchasing RECs. Um, and they're mostly sourcing from wind or, wind or biomass as well. Okay, and then water stewardship is the, another category we look at. Um, we really want our product manufacturers to understand what are their impacts to the local water supplies. So we make them basically do a self-audit to understand what are the water issues in their area um, and what are the impacts of um, what, what they're putting back into the water supply. 
So again, design tax is the example we talked about. Um, by taking that step to optimize their dyes, they basically eliminated any water issues that they had as well. Um, and once they did that, the water, the effluent coming out of their factory was as clean as what was coming in. Um, so that was actually a side benefit. Their main concern when they had changed over their dyes was the waste issue because they really wanted to um, not have to pay the hazardous waste shipping fee. And actually having the clean water was an additional benefit that also saved them money um, and allowed them to um, not have the same level of, of regulation and um, water treatment that most um, textile factories have to have. Stone is another example of companies who are doing innovative things with their water. So in their process of making these recycled glass durable surfaces, they are keeping all water in the facility in a closed loop cycle. So they're filtering and reusing any water they're using for rinsing the product or processing the um, processing the products, everything stays in a closed loop. So nothing is leaving the factory um, and putting an impact. Well, Excuse me, I should say, no, no, the processed water is leaving the factory. I'm sure they have um, you know, faucets and toilets in their facility. And then, of course, social fairness. So we want to make sure that people are, that manufacturers are considering the human elements of, of their manufacturing. You know, so one, one example we've looked at is um, Highland Craftsman, who makes these um, bark, um, bark tiles to go on the exterior or interior of the building. Um, and one thing they've done is they really were committed to creating a responsible supply chain. So they went, they went through and really trained all of their suppliers. They provided sustainability trainings. They had requirements that each supplier had to sign the same global Sullivan principles that they abide to for social responsibility. Um, and they also train them. They are committed to sourcing only only local and reclaimed bark. So these are, this is bark from trees that were already cut down um, for the logs. And so they went through and really retrained everyone how to harvest the bark that was um, going to be wasted as mulch originally. And so they really were. Um, they've really become a, the center of their community and a source of. Um, extra income, even doubling income for loggers by really focusing on sourcing locally to their community. Is Bark House in the U.S.? It is. It's um, near, it's about an hour outside of Asheville. So the bark is, is solely yellow poplar bark sourced from that Appalachian region. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Tish, this is Matt. We have one question from the audience quick, uh, okay. from Rosa. She's wondering, regarding the recycled content used in materials that you were talking about, how is this monitored for each batch of products manufactured? As an example, she gives uh, the amount of actual recycled content used in manufacturing certain materials can vary based on supply of source materials. Uh, this may come into effect for just gypsum board products, for example, or recycled gypsum may be in a varying supply from one month to the next, and the percentage might vary. How does that affect the rating for the product? Great question. So um, we take the, the lowest in the range. So if the recycle concept fluctuates, when we calculate the material reutilization score, then we'll take the lower number to be conservative. So they'll give us a range and we'll take the lowest number. Um, in addition, actually, when we look at the material health, we also require testing for um, the recycled content. So let's say ice stone, our, my countertop example, um, they use recycled glass, so they were they um, for the countertop itself had a gold rating for material health, and in order to achieve that with recycled content, since their content stream changes regularly, they have to provide annual testing showing that they had no toxic heavy metals in their recycling stream, and for anything with recycled paper, it's quarterly testing that's required. So we are, you know, allowing for recycled content um, ranges in both the material realization and material health categories. Um, and so to wrap up social social responsibility, um, this certified B Corporation is one program that a lot of our manufacturers are using. It's actually one of the requirements at the gold level 
in this category, you have to have some sort of third-party social fairness certification. Um, so B Corp is what we recommend for American and European companies since we don't have a lot of the same child labor issues or other issues that um, developing countries have. Um, SA 8000 is another program that we recommend for companies pursuing certification at the gold level. So we give, we give them some options of which one to choose. Here's a list of some companies who have already become cer um, certified B Corps. Um, so this next section, um, I'm going to go through it very quickly because it's, um, I want you to just get a feel for what we require under the version 3 standard. Since we're limited on time, I'm just going to kind of breeze through material health. And since this is um, available on video afterwards, you can um, look through the criteria in more detail, or you can read through the criteria um, on our website or the Institute's website. But I, I just want to give you sort of an idea of um, what products are available at each level and, and what when you see V3 certified basic, what does that mean? Um, so at the basic level, um, one major change we've made from version 2 is that we realized there were way too many products sort of clustered at um, the silver level. So we've actually expanded to five levels. There's now basic bronze is the new level, um, silver, gold, and platinum. Um, so the basic level, we actually made it a lower bar of entry um, just to get people in the door. So when we're looking at um, continuous improvement as one of our um, the ideas of the program. So we've made BASIC actually a little bit easier than it was in version 2. And sort of bronze is now what BASIC used to be. Um, so version 3 BASIC is actually provisional level. It's, it's really just to help companies get their foot in the door. You saw how complicated just even the material health um, assessment is. So it really helps companies sort of get started get familiar with the program, and they basically have two years to upgrade to bronze or higher. So at the basic level, they're not allowed to use the certification mark on the product. They can talk about it and print web material. So we're trying to give manufacturers an incentive just to get their foot in the door, because it's, it's a pretty high bar just to get started. So for material health, what that means is they basically can just characterize their materials very generally. You know, so for uh, a chair, that might mean you know fiber. We have um, textile, foam, um, metal, plastic, and they itemize what types of plastic, et cetera. So it's a pretty basic characterization, hence the term basic. Um, and so here are some examples of products who are currently at the basic level. Again, they they have two years um, to upgrade, and some of these companies have products at other levels as well. So um, Allied also has a has a product at the gold level. Deso has products at the silver level. Dow has products at the silver level. So you know, it's also depending on the complexity of the product or which products they've decided to, to focus more energy on. So bronze level is brand new to version 3. Um, so in the bronze level, um, you have to have 75% of your materials assessed if you're a technical nutrient. Again, going back into the biosphere, or excuse me, 75% if you're a technical nutrient and it's getting recycled, or 100% assessed if it's a biological nutrient and going back in the biosphere. So that means everything, all of that is assessed down to the chemical level to so the CAS number, 100 parts per million. And then you also have to provide us with a strategy of how you're going to get rid of your excess or problematic materials. So right now, we only have a few products at the bronze level because it's brand new. Deso has some um, flooring products at the base at the bronze level. And the silver level is where most of the products have lived um, under version 2. So I imagine actually a lot of the silver products from version 2 are probably going to get um, downgraded to bronze in version 3 because we upped the criteria for the silver level. So now at the silver level, you have to have 95% um, completion of 95% completion of your formulation, 100% if you're a biological nutrient, um, and you can have no ingredients anywhere in your product that are carcinogens, mutagens, or reproductive toxins. So that's also why at the silver level um, for version three you can get the higher level credit under lead. So they're recognizing that you've achieved something that um, you can 
um, verify that you have no carcinogens, mutagens, or reproductive toxins in your product. So here's a list of some silver certified products. Again, all of these right now are certified at the silver level. Um, they have until 2015 to upgrade to version 3. Um, so it's possible some of these might drop down to bronze, some of these might stay at silver. Um, so again, we're still sort of in that grandfathering period. There'll be a mix of products that are certified to version 2 and version 3. But it will say which version they are certified to on the Institute website. But you can see there's quite a range here. There's, um, there are stones, there's lighting products, there's window shade fabrics, um, countertops, flooring, playground equipment, all different products. At the gold level, and this has always intended to be the gold standard, and this is consistent with version 2 and version 3, um, and that's 100% um, assessed, so we know everything in your product, and we can verify that there are absolutely no chemicals of concern in the product, and that you also have to, if it's an interior product, there are VOC emissions testing required as well, and in the emissions, there can also be no problematic ingredients in the emissions. So even with this very high bar, and this is usually the criterion that um, will keep people from the gold, from the gold level, um, because it is certainly the hardest one to achieve at the gold level. So here's a sampling of products at the gold level. Again, at the gold level, even in version 2, it's, these products are eligible for the higher points in the LEED V4 credit. Um, so steel case from Miller has different products. We have a concrete sealer. So all different products. And the platinum level has always been designed to be our 100% good ideal. So we actually have uh, no platinum products certified. Um, and that's somewhat by design. We try to keep um, pushing the envelope. So from version 1 to version 2 to version 3, um, as with LEED, the criteria keep getting harder. Um, and, and with that, we, we keep making platinum harder as well. So um, we're trying to keep um, setting higher and higher goals for manufacturers to reach. Um, so in the material health category, what that means is not only have we looked at everything in your product, but we've also assessed any of your process chemicals. So one example might be for, um, for metal products, we look at the plating. So if it's a um, trivalent chromium plating, that is considered problematic. Um, oh, excuse me, if it's a hexavalent chromium plating, it's problematic. And we'd want everyone to source their screws or metal, part, metal parts with trivalent chromium um, finish. And so the issue with hexavalent chromium is actually in the process chemistry. So there's not a lot of that in the finished product, but the issue is more in the processing of the product. So at the platinum level, we're really expanding the scope of what we're examining to not just the finished product, but you know what else it might be going out to the environment along the way throughout the process. So the, the scope is um, largely expanded at platinum. Okay, so um, I want to address, you know, how is material health and, and what we're doing um, in the Cradle to Cradle program, how is that being viewed in the building industry? So there's actually been a lot of traction in the last few years um, around this issue. Here are some of the reasons it's become um, such a hot button topic is because in the United States there really just is not a lot of regulation required for new chemicals. Um, New chemicals aren't really required to provide, to have any safety testing done. Um, in fact, most chemicals are not tested for safety to human environmental health before they're released. So we do not practice the precautionary principle here. Um, but that is something they're pushing towards in Europe with their REACH regulation. And so as a response to sort of our lack of regulation here um, in the building industry, there's um, been quite a growth in programs like ours who are trying to address these topics. So HPD, they're encouraging uh, manufacturers to self-declare everything, all ingredients that are in their um, products. Um, Ferros is, is supporting that along with Green Screen. Of course, there's also the Living Building Challenge, which has their own red list and their own requirements. Um, so, and LEED and USGBC, of course, is trying to address um, healthier materials as well. So, in LEED version 4, you know, they've made an attempt to really 
um, create some new materials and resource credits, including the Cradle to Cradle one that um, address the topic of healthier building materials. Um, so here's a little bit of history. You know, Lead before um, had new had new credits being drafted, um, and then even this past green build, um, the USGBC had really started to take a stand on healthy building materials, and we're getting a lot of flack from the chemical industry. Um, this past January, they had a summit on green building and human health with all of those programs included, HPD, Living Building Challenge, and they actually started a material health working group to keep, um, keep this discussion going, try to encourage more collaboration between all of these programs, and, you know, and I'll try to do it quickly because we are running out of time. I have some slides that sort of discusses what is the difference between our program and some of these other programs, and how are we each tackling um, human health in a different way. Um, I know we're getting low on time. There was one question related to the, the stuff you just talked about, so I wanted to address that first. Um, okay. Question here for um, the chemical assessments. Um, how, how, if at all, does Cradle to Cradle work with manufacturers and their upstream suppliers in providing proprietary formulations? So what we do that's pretty unique, and that's a great question. Um, MBDC houses all of that information. So that's why we have that rating system. That's one way we can sort of communicate up the supply chain um, what the issues are without divulging any proprietary information. So for example, when I contact the um, textile dye supplier, I will, MEDC signs a non-disclosure agreement with that dye supplier. They provide the formulation to us and we do an assessment. So then we report back to the textile manufacturer, your dye got an ABCX assessment, either you know red, yellow, or green, or black. Um, and that's generally all the information we can share with them. Um, but then we can also provide them that information that there is this type of problematic chemical here. Um, this is what we need to try to optimize. Can you, you either need to work with your supplier, have them design for you a, a better solution, a different dye, or you know, find another supplier who can. So that's sort of how we, we protect proprietary information without, um, but also make progress. Um, so that's very different from what someone like HPD is doing and what they're asking manufacturers to do is, is share that information publicly. Um, and the challenge is that I would say most manufacturers are probably not ready to do that. Um, so our, our system, having a third party who's not making any products, we're not you know, going to sell off their formulation, um, and we have you know, a history of, of being trusted by manufacturers, it, it helps um, facilitate a process for manufacturers to improve their um, ingredients without having to um, see all of the ingredients themselves. Okay, so I mean, we talked a little bit about the lead credit, um, lead before credit already. What I left out previously were the other uh, programs that you can use to get those points. So, in option one, HPD is an option, health product declaration. In option two, green screen is also an option, as well as reach. Um, so, they're recognizing multiple programs when you have to hit um, the 20 products from five manufacturers or. 25% um, by cost, you can include Cradle to Cradle with some of these other programs. Um, so inventory assessment and optimization, that's kind of a theme we're talking about and how we look at um, products. We inventory all the way down the supply chain, we provide that red, yellow, green assessment, and then we provide a path for them to optimize or improve. And so this is how we differ from some of these other programs is that, as you can see, different programs really address only certain stages of this process. Declare is really just having you um, list what do you have. Same with HPD. It's really um, providing that list of ingredients. And the GS list translator is the green screen. So green, green screen provides part of the assessment. Green screen does just the chemical profiling. And if you remember, I talked about we also do material risk assessment with exposure and some other factors considered. So ours goes even a step beyond green screen. Um, similar with Pharos, again, you know, they're using green screen list translator. So really you're getting inventory plus a chemical only assessment when you're looking through Pharos. Um, green screen does offer a full assessment. Um, 
of proprietary information, which you can consult with them. Um, but again, they don't do the full material assessment um, like we do. So the, the limitation with that is if you're someone like Herman Miller or Steelcase, you're not necessarily going to have the full formulation of the uh, black dye that you use in your fabric or the coating um, that you're using on another part. So you're not necessarily going to have access to that level of information. So unless you are far enough down the supply chain that you know the full formulation, um, some of these programs would be very difficult to participate in because you, you really just don't know. So another way, um, so again, we're really just sort of trying to explain how are we different and, and where are we going. Um, and how far do we go compared to others? So again, HP, HPD um, is really just looking at transparency. Um, but in, under cradle to cradle, we have, we're looking at transparency. We're doing a chemicals of concern screen. And you can see the other differentiator is that we actually verify it. So the other two programs, HPD and Declare, are really just self-claims. Um, and in our years of experience, the problem I see with programs who are asking manufacturers to do these claims themselves is that they really don't know what they don't know. So if all they know is that they're buying a black dye or they're um, choosing this finish, um, those, those um, dye suppliers and those chemical suppliers are not required by law to share anything more about their formulation than what's on an MSDS, which is not very much information at all. So when, when manufacturers are doing self-proclamations of what's in their products, they only really know, you know up to a certain percent of what's in their product. They can only really tell you what their suppliers have publicly um, shared in an MSDS. But that's, that's such a small part of the story of, of what's really in their product. Um, so really quickly, this is just a quick visual. Um, how do our chemicals of concerns list compare? And again, we, you know, you'll have the video. You can look at this in more detail later, because there's certainly a lot of terms and charts um, and items to look at. But, but basically, you know, we have our band list in black. There's the living building challenge red list in the middle. There's the um, Perkins and Will precautionary list to the left. Um, and this is how we sort of overlap. And the layer on top of that, so basically we have our band list, which overlaps, and that's in black. And then anything red is um, a, would be a red assessed or X chemical in our program, which means that um, they would be limited to silver level or lower, and that they would be required to have some sort of optimization plan to remove those chemicals. So really, our, our program sort of includes our either bans most of these chemicals or are forcing manufacturers to get rid of them if they want to continue on further in the program. Um, again, we're, we're really just trying to compare different types of assessments. You know, again, HPD and DECLARE, it's a self-proclamation, um, so um, they're not true assessments of um, how toxic chemical, the chemicals are in your product. Um, Green Screen is the only other program that's doing something similar, and their um, assessment really stops at the chemical level. So again, we add hazard plus exposure plus what is the um, recyclability or compostability of the material. Um, so we have a material assessment and a chemical assessment instead of just chemical only. Um, again, optimization is that last stage. So, um, you know, beyond some of these other programs, we're also trying to push organizations or companies to keep improving. So, constant improvement is a requirement. Upon their renewal, they have to report to us how have they uh, made progress against their strategies to eliminate problematic ingredients. Have they made progress? Um, toward increasing the amount of renewable energy they're using? Have they made progress against any of the other strategies in, in all five categories? And then also having multiple levels is, is sort of a guideline for how to optimize. So there, there's a clear path from basic to bronze, bronze to silver, silver to gold, et cetera. So the good news is that, you know, again, with that working group through U.S. Green Building Council, um, we are trying to coalesce some of these programs. It's, it's very hard for you, know, you specifiers to keep up with, you know, what's the difference between all these programs if I um, 
stack of product and it's silver cradle to cradle, but they also have a green screen benchmark one. What does that mean? Um, so there is a lot of work being done in the background to try to make this an easier process to try to align some of these programs. So Cradle to Cradle has actually already aligned with the green screen um, assessment. So any manufacturers who have gotten a green screen assessment, you can transition over to Cradle to Cradle very seamlessly. We will accept a green screen assessment towards your Cradle to Cradle certification. So since Cradle to Cradle goes beyond what green screen does, we're doing other categories. We're doing material assessment above their chemical assessment. Um, you can apply it towards your Cradle to Cradle and keep going. So there is a lot of work to try to make this easier on all of you so it's not such a um, confusing array of green labels out there. Um, so overall, you know, what we want you to walk away with is that, you know, it's, it is now a third-party independent program um, run by the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. Um, it's multi-attribute. It's multiple levels of achievement. There is continuous improvement along the way. So we don't want products to just get silver certified and, and stay there. They have to keep working on some of their issues to keep improving. Um, and it can also now be a tool to help you select products. So being written into some of these programs, such as Green Wizard, such as um, our new lead credits, um, being listed in the US EPA's database, it, it can help provide you with tools um, to quickly assess products. So when you're selecting hundreds of products at a time for, for a building, this can be a logo you can look for to help you understand um, what you're getting with the product when you see that logo. Okay, uh, Tish, we're going to have to sign off now. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any other questions. But we thank you for your presentation.